Well, um, mine was really inspired by a fantastic investigative piece in the New York Times recently that focused on the number of Americans who are living in poverty, who aren't necessarily living on the streets, but can't afford housing and find themselves essentially paying week to week in motels across the country. And that number really exploded uh, in 2008. I want to talk about what's led to this situation and what could be done to solve it. So... During the coronavirus pandemic, private equity firm Blackstone realized that it just could not let another disaster go to waste. So they decided to prey on the country's poor even further by investing heavily in the extended stay hotel business. Blackstone and Starwood Capital acquiring Extended Stay America for $6 billion. This is, guys, one of the few hotel brands that did thrive during the pandemic, offering furnished rooms and a kitchenette at a lower price. It did see strong demand last year from construction and healthcare workers. An average occupancy, get this, of 74 percent compared to the industry average of 44 percent last year. So I want to talk about the statistics that she mentioned in that video, because it's the exact reason why Blackstone, a private equity firm that is in the business of snatching up residential properties across the country and turning them into rentals, would want to invest in extended stay hotels. Now, extended stay hotels typically house individuals who are unable to rent a traditional apartment. And so when you look at the numbers in typical hotels, traditional hotels versus extended stay hotels, you'll notice a trend. The broader hotel industry endured enormous losses during the coronavirus pandemic, with occupancy rates plummeting to 44% for 2020. Extended Stay America's occupancy rate was around 74%. The publicly held company has experienced industry-defying prosperity during the pandemic, $96 million in profits on revenues of $1 billion in 2020. So that is exactly why Blackstone would be interested in investing in the extended stay uh, business. It's because first off, obviously, when it came to the coronavirus pandemic, they didn't have to worry about losing business because people are literally living there long term. And also, as more and more Americans get pushed out of the housing market, get pushed out of uh, being able to even afford regular apartments, they're finding shelter in these you know, extended stay hotels that allow people to pay uh, week to week. Now, the CEO of Extended Stay provided some more insight on this trend by saying, quote, we learned in pretty hard, we leaned in pretty hard early onto some of the more longer term, lower rated businesses to fill up our hotels. We call that sort of our residential, uh, we call that sort of our residential bucket. So what he's referring to there is, yeah, we know that people are now literally living in these hotels. We want to corner that market just as we've cornered uh, other forms of housing, including uh, trailer parks, by the way. And so they put in their money and they want to be the landlord of not just people who are renting their uh homes in their apartments, but people who have no other choice but to live in these extended stay hotels. So uh, the truth is, when you look at the numbers uh, and how much they've exploded in recent year years, you'll get an understanding of how, honestly, the housing situation um, and this economy has destroyed the financial stability of so many Americans. For instance, uh, there are 5.6 million hotel rooms in the United States, according to STR, that's a hospitality research firm, roughly half a million of them are classified as extended stay. And that's actually up from 200,000 two decades ago. So the number is rapidly increasing. And this has a serious impact on children as well. The numbers are just incredibly depressing. As more adults, for instance, have moved into hotels and motels, so have more school children. 97,640 lived in these settings during the 2018 to 2019 school year, up from 45,781 in 2004 to 2005. And that's according to the National Center for Homeless Education. And the situation has gotten so bad that there are literally public school 
school districts across the country that are making bus stops to pick up children from these hotels and motels. Columbus City Schools in Ohio, for instance, classified 3,431 students as homeless in the school year that ended in 2020, including 204 who lived in hotels or motels. The school system makes 16 bus stops at hotels or motels um, and extended stays. Uh, when you look at Georgia, you see a very similar situation in uh, Winnet County Public Schools, for instance, the largest school district in Georgia, 91 bus stops at hotels, motels, or extended stays pick up nearly 600 students. And as you can imagine, the living conditions in these extended stay hotels are pretty dire. Even before the coronavirus pandemic, low-income areas of Orlando were plagued by a lack of affordable housing, with families packing into crumbling motels. The Star Motel in Kissimmee, which was in disarray before the pandemic hit, was pushed over the edge by the recent economic shutdown. The motel's owner abandoned it in December. Since then, residents have been left to run the place. The power has been shut off at least four times. Call and tell her to come and see because they're shutting the power right now. Right now. Tell her to come and see it. In early August, the electric company trucks were back again. The motel's residents needed to pay $1,500 to keep the power on. Have you paid anything? Have you done anything yeah, for actually, us? Yeah, actually, I have. Go ask Florio, because I just messaged him the receipt from what I did pay on the line. Right now. I have it on due Facebook, due too. Today is the due date. This don't should have been paid on Friday, like every other Friday. They have been paid, because we went and got the money. It's absolutely heartbreaking to watch that. And it's not an isolated case. Uh, this is what people are experiencing across the country in every state. And while financial advisors argue that Americans shouldn't pay more than 30% of their income on housing, the aftermath of the 2008 economic collapse made that impossible. Think about it. Wages remain stagnant. People were evicted, kicked out of their homes, and you have private equity firms buying up all the residential property, manipulating the market, lowering the inventory of available homes. I mean, it has been a complete and utter disaster for the very victims of that economic collapse, and they're feeling the ramifications of that even today. Watch. I make $13 an hour. I get a 400 and something, $20 weekly i have to make three times the income to get a house and i'm the head of half household even if i bought work by myself with my daughter i wouldn't make it because a two bedroom is not 1200 a two bedroom is 1400 it's 1500 if you find uh, low housing do you have like a three-year wait minimum six months but that will never happen because there's so many people looking for affordable housing right now that I have been told that it's a three-year wait. And even before the 2008 economic collapse, the economy was already grappling with low-income housing shortages. And this is an important part of the story. It's something that I think we need to really focus on quite often uh, when we discuss the issue of affordable housing, because there was a notable shift in the 1980s that needs to be addressed today. For instance, by the mid 1980s, federal and state governments mostly stopped building public housing directly. The thinking was that private investors lured with tax credits would build enough affordable housing instead. And as you can imagine, that did not work out so well. The policy largely failed people with extremely low incomes. And over roughly the same period, the available public housing units declined to 9,000, I'm sorry, 958,000 at the end of 2020 from 1.4 million in 1990, according to HUD. It's the portion of the housing stock declining the most, says Andrew um, Arand, uh, the vice president for research at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Once you start contracting these development projects to private industry that has a profit motive, clearly they're not going to do what's necessary in providing housing for low-income families. I mean, we've seen how much of a failure this project has been for decades. And unfortunately, that same 
strategy is being utilized across the country. In the state of California, for instance, where we increased our taxes, there was a ballot initiative called HHH, and it overwhelmingly passed because Californians wanted to pay a little more in taxes to ensure that we were building more affordable housing. That project so far has been a failure because uh, state and local politicians have decided rather than creating government jobs, construction jobs, and building these homes through those jobs, they've instead decided to grant contracts to private real estate developers who have been obviously incredibly awful, as is noticed it by the exploding homeless population in the state of California. Now, the lack of affordable housing coupled with stagnant wages has created this recipe for disaster. Like millions of Americans, Carla and her family are caught in the long wake of the 2008 financial crisis. What happened when we hit the foreclosure crisis is that all of a sudden, Millions of families lost their homes. They became renters competing in the same rental housing market. And at the same time, incomes were going down even if you could keep your job. And that led to a rental affordability crisis in this country that's as bad as it's ever been in our history. Did he come with a dollar? We have over 11 million renter households that are paying more than half of their income towards their rent each month. That means that they are, you know, one emergency, uh, one broken down car, one illness, one missed day of work away from not being able to pay the rent. And you shouldn't minimize the impact of low paying jobs and the emergence of the gig economy, which certainly has also contributed to this problem. For instance, one in five adults who wanted more work were doing without full time work in late 2019. And that's according to the Federal Reserve. And 53 million people have low wage jobs. Research from the Brookings Institution shows an expanding industry built on informal and impermanent housing is a reflection of the precariousness that increasingly defines daily life for millions of Americans. But one of the other contributing factors that needs to be discussed is the financial surveillance that takes place in this country, something that Americans do not opt into, something that Americans cannot opt out of, and something that certainly has all sorts of privacy concerns tangled into uh, the economic anxiety that it leads to. So what I'm talking about here is credit monitoring. And credit monitoring is what uh, is used by banks uh, to decide whether or not you deserve a loan or a mortgage. Uh, it's used by employers to decide whether or not you are worthy of a job if you're trustworthy enough to employ. And it's also used by landlords to decide whether they're willing to take the risk in leasing their property to you so you can live. Now, the problem is after the 2008 economic collapse, many people were evicted from their homes. They were foreclosed on. And that obviously ends up on credit reports, which landlords take a look at to decide whether or not they're going to lease or rent to any individual or family. Um, in fact, uh, if you take a look at how credit reports are really done, again, something that we can't even opt into, uh, or I'm sorry, opt out of. The fact of the matter is these reports that are relied on so heavily have all sorts of errors and flaws. So even if you do everything right, even if you haven't been evicted, even if you weren't a victim of the 2008 economic collapse, you might find that your credit report has all sorts of errors on it that is hurting your chances of qualifying for a loan, qualifying for housing, or qualifying for a job. So CNBC found that the credit reports of about one in five people have an error of some kind. Um, and by the way, that was based on a study done by the Federal Trade Commission. It also doesn't help that these credit bureaus like Experian, TransUnion, Equifax uh, are obviously not spending any money to beef up their security because in 2017, there was a giant data breach. Plaintiff Jamie McDonagall says criminals have already used his information to make four illegal credit inquiries. I never gave Equifax 
any kind of consent to have my information in the first place. Uh, and so they took my information without my, without my permission and then were careless with it. Today, 36 senators called for federal investigations into three Equifax executives who sold stock before the breach went public, though the company has said the execs didn't know of the breach. What really troubles me is the amount of time it took for Equifax to come forward and, and let us know that we were at risk, that our, our identities had been compromised. But will Equifax be held accountable? Already, credit agencies face fewer regulations than banks. Congressional Republicans want to further reduce regulations. The company has spent half a million dollars this year lobbying Congress to ease regulations and its liability in data breaches. Money well spent because while the federal government flirted with the idea of banning employers from using credit reports uh, to decide who they hire and who they don't hire, uh, that really didn't go anywhere. Um, there are some states, some municipalities that are uh, trying to tackle this issue. But the fact of the matter is, uh, generally speaking, employers get to decide whether they hire you by looking at your credit report, which, of course, has no bearing on whether or not someone is qualified for a job or whether or not you know, the credit report would have an impact on their ability to conduct the work that they would be hired for. So really there are two major solutions to this that we should be advocating for. Number one, there should be more pressure applied to the federal government to ensure that employers cannot look at credit reports in making their hiring decisions. That's number one, because how are people supposed to get out of this giant economic hole if they're not able to get hired as a result of what's on their credit report, if they're not able to make money or, or earn income as a result of what's on their credit report, that needs to be banned. That should be illegal. But the most important part of this, in my opinion, has to do with righting the wrongs of the 1980s, where we did this shift from publicly, uh, you know, publicly produced housing uh, to essentially relying on private industry to construct these homes and these apartments. So what we need to do is get the federal government or even state governments uh, to focus on creating jobs by hiring government employees to construct these homes. And they would, in fact, be low income homes, public homes that we hand off to people who need it. And, and look, the, the big goal moving forward, honestly, in, and I, it's a long-term goal for obvious reasons, is to take the profit motive out of housing. The reason why landlords are looking at credit reports is because they want to ensure that when they rent to someone, they're getting a return on their investment. And their investment, of course, is the property that they own. So there's the profit motive behind it. We need to do away with that because housing shouldn't have a profit motive. The bare necessities of life to, to live a decent life shouldn't have a profit motive. But in the short term, I think a very clear solution is to shift away from relying on private real estate developers by creating jobs, federal or statewide government jobs to construct these homes and ensure that they are meant to benefit low-income households. Jen. Thanks, Anna. That was great. Um, you know, to your point about the ways that the housing, housing, affordable housing and credit kind of intermingle, uh, something I was thinking about when you were doing your decode is how, although landlords, as you point out, are such sticklers about looking at your credit, like you're probably not going to be able to rent an apartment, let alone a very nice apartment if you have bad credit. But the thing is, building credit is extremely difficult and hilariously and ironically, paying rent on time does not go into your credit score. I think that that just goes to show how stacked the deck is against people who are working class, who are poor, who don't have credit, who are trying to build credit, um, and how tilted the balance of power is in favor of not just, you know, financial institutions, but also landlords, right? Um, and, you know, to the subject of kind of building credit and how expensive it is to be poor in America, so to speak, um, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who has this experience. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, especially with regard to what you were talking about, like this is pretty unremarkable. But I remember when I was in my 20s and I like didn't have any credit and I was like, oh, like, you know, maybe I should get a credit card or like get a cell phone or whatever. Um, I couldn't open a credit card because I didn't have pre-existing credit, right? So I applied for a credit card, it was denied. Um, and I was like, I don't know how to build credit. 
Um, and you know, the same situation repeated itself when I think I went to get like my first iPhone or whatever. And they were like, you don't have any credit. So you need to put down a $500 deposit if you want this phone and you want this phone plan. And again, it just goes to show how, how vicious of a cycle it is, right? Like, how are you supposed to build credit when you can't do things like get a phone bill, right? Or even get a credit card to begin building credit. And just to add on to that, you know, when I think I finally was like, okay, this is how I'm going to build credit. What I had to do was open a secured credit card, which of course is when you put down a deposit. So I think in this case, it was like Capital One. And, you know, I had to put down a $200 deposit and my credit limit was $200. So it was clearly just a debit card, right? Um, but if you don't have the $200, like what are you supposed to do? So right. again, the credit system is just a complete mess. And it is, as you say, just a, a complete nightmare how heavily uh, not just landlords, but employers rely on this one score, which, as you point out, is also vulnerable to uh, fraud, to mistakes. Um, it, it It is really life ruining. It really is. Absolutely. And, you know, the thing that also stands out is just how much people get punished if they like, let's say you've decided, you know what, I'm not into borrowing. I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested in credit cards because think about it in order to build your credit, you got to get a credit card. Right. Like that's step number one, which is a challenge in and of itself, but it encourages people to go into debt. Right. And so it's that is also a problem. And for people who have decided, no, I'm not really, I'm not going to fall for that. I'm not interested in that. You know, I have a friend actually who has been saving and saving and saving and finally has a down payment for a modest home. So he's looking to, to buy, but he never really took out credit cards, doesn't really have, he doesn't have bad credit. He just doesn't have credit. Right. And so what he was told was, look, your income is high. You have enough for the down payment. So you'll qualify for the loan but you have to take out what's called a jumbo loan, mm -hmm. meaning that his interest rate is going to be somewhere around 5% when right now the interest rates for mortgages are at historic lows, mm -hmm. far lower than 5%. Yep. And so it, it really does um, punish people in so many ways and kind of accelerate economic ruin. And it needs to be addressed because we didn't sign up for this. That's right. the other thing. Right. We're having all of this financial information about us being collected by private companies, these credit bureaus, and they're selling it for profit. Right. And it's, right. it's you know, it's what social media companies are doing now as well. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but, you know, the real OGs of that grift uh, were Experian, TransUnion, and mm -hmm, Equifax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I I didn't pull a screenshot of this article, but I recently saw something in Vox. I think it was yesterday or the day before. And it was talking about um, how credit card re rewards, so like cash back or like travel points or whatever, um, the article's framing was like, your credit card rewards punish the poor because, you know, the people who have credit cards and who have these rewards, and especially like the higher tier rewards, tend to be more affluent, of course. Um, but what happens is because credit card companies, you know, need to cover those fees and need to cover rewards, they pass on those costs, of course, to businesses who then hike up the costs. So then people who are paying cash, you know, get hit with higher prices. So in, in essence, you know, if you're poor, again, you're going to be paying more just because you don't have credit. Now, I think that that phenomenon is probably true, or I mean, we know it's true, right? Like if you're paying mm -hmm. in cash, as we've just been discussing, like you're going to be hit with this kind of hidden penalty. But I also think, you know, framing it as like, you should feel bad about your credit card rewards is like not not actually what's the problem here, right? Like you're yeah. not, like, because you got your JetBlue card or whatever, like that's not the problem. The problem is, as you've been saying, this entire system of credit that we are forced to participate in if we want to get, uh, you know, not just like a favorable mortgage interest rate, but also housing or, you know, like uh, uh, appeal to employers. I mean, we're all basically forced into this system that uh, exploits everybody, obviously some more than others. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a reason why this system is stacked against us. I mean, in, in one of those clips I showed, you can see how in a short period of time, these credit bureaus uh, spend so much money in political donations. And yeah. it's because, you know, they, they want to ensure that they can continue uh, making their profits without the worry or concern of financial uh, regulations. And yeah, yeah it's, it's a huge issue.